Welcome back to my channel. I'm Brian Kafke, and this video is continuing the series on mastering Databricks and Apache Open Source Spark. This is lesson 23, really one of the most important lessons because we're not only covering PySpark, but the core of data engineering on PySpark, which is data frames. So we're going to jump in and talk all about how to use data frames. I'll start by talking about what is a data frame, because you may not know. A data frame is really just like an in-memory table. That's how I think of it, like a SQL Server type of table that we just brought into memory. It's organized as rows of information and columns, and the, each column identifies a different type of data element. So if we want to do analysis, on, for instance, on customers, we might have a data frame like this, customer ID, first name, last name, and email. And we can sort, slice, dice, et cetera, group on it, et cetera. So that's the idea of a data frame. Let's take a look at how to use them now. Our notebook code today is titled AdventureWorks Exploratory Data Analysis, EDA, using Python data frames. I'm calling this part two because we've already done one that really did extensive coverage of how to use SQL directly from PySpark. Now, I do put a lot of links in these, and I hope they're useful to people. I'll be happy to see a comment if people use these links I put in. But I find sometimes finding good documentation can be tricky. A nice thing about Databricks is since it resides at using Apache Spark under the covers, the Apache Spark documentation pretty much counts 100%. And so you can really get a lot more documentation there than can be replicated by Databricks. So don't waste it, especially when you're talking about something like PySpark. There's also a nice reference here specifically in the Spark documentation, which talks about data frames. So I put it there so you don't have to search to find it. And I was looking for something to give me a little bit of a shape of how to talk about using PySpark data frames. And I found this blog towards datascience.com. And this link I'll put in here. Um, I do want to credit the people that did it. I did not, uh, I did cut and paste a little bit of that code, but I was mostly looking for sort of a reference to say, have I covered things? So it's also a good one to take a look at. And it's kind of nice because it's a blog. You don't have to watch it as a video. You can kind of scroll around. But I do want to credit. It's actually a really nice blog. And I point out here too, you don't have to import the uh, PySpark because that's already automatically done for you on a Databricks cluster. And as I always have to say with this, if you have not already imported the files, uploaded the files into the Databricks workspace and created the tables in SQL, then please go back to lesson nine and do that. I don't use a lot of the SQL tables in this particular lesson, but I recommend doing that once and being done with it and just holding on to it. I also want to remind you of a prefix naming convention I use with data frames for several reasons. The two things I really want to keep track of are one, am I looking at a local data frame or am I looking at a Spark data frame? Because I can have both going on in the same notebook. The other thing I want to keep track of is what language did I use to create the data frame? Because different languages within a notebook cannot look at data frames in other languages. So for instance, if you've got an R cell, you cannot write code manipulating a Python data frame. And of course, I showed you in the last video, a quick way to get around that is to persist it as a SQL table because SQL tables are available to all the languages. They're exposed equally. So what I do to kind of provide this knowledge is the first character I put in is either an S for it's a Spark data frame or an L for local. Now you might say, well, why is that? Why do I care about that? What's the difference? Well, the difference is that if you think about a local pandas data frame, that runs only in the driver node. It really runs as if it's like a little computer running for you, a single node. And that's because Pandas was not designed to be distributed and used across many machines. So you want to keep track of that. A Spark data frame is designed to process effectively at scale. In other words, it can run parallel processing because it, it creates chunks out of the data frame and distributes that over the nodes. And then it can run the queries in parallel. Now you might think, well, why would I want to use Pandas data frames then? And the answer comes down to the fact that there is a lot of really good open source libraries that work with Pandas data frame. And they won't work with the Spark data frame because they don't understand the distribution of a Spark data frame. So there's a lot of reasons why you're going to want to go back and forth between a Spark data frame for that scaled out data engineering and a Pandas data frame for things like using maybe scikit-learn for training a local model, or maybe using some of the visualization libraries that are available to Pandas. So I like to know right off the bat, is it local or is it Spark? The second character is, as I mentioned, I want to know what language is this data frame? Because I can't just grab a, 
a Python PySpark data frame and use it in R, or for that matter, even a Pandas data frame, because they're different. The third and fourth characters, I used to just make sure I know this is in fact a data frame versus some other type of object. So it'll be something like SPDF, which means it's Spark Python data frame, and then an underscore, and then some sort of you know meaningful name. So if you were to see in my code something like this, SPDF underscore sales summary, then you know it's a Spark Python data frame containing sales information. There's a lot going on in this example, but the most important thing I'm trying to demonstrate is the use of reading files externally to load into a data frame. So this is different than when I did SQL before. We're going to use the SQL context here, which is already created for us by Databricks. And then we're going to say the read method. And we're telling it that the format coming in is CSV. Then we want to tell it, is the first row in the CSV file the names of the columns, which is a very common thing to do in CSV files, and generally it makes it a lot easier if you can say yes to that question. In this case, it is, which means that it will take those column names and use those as the names of the columns in the data frame when it loads it. The next option is infer schema. Schema means what are the column types, what are the data types, are they integers, are they strings, etc. Now infer schema means as I load the data frame from the file, Databricks is going to analyze it to determine what type to create each column as. So that's kind of a handy thing. It can add some overhead if it's a really large file, so you don't always want to do that. But we're going to take that handy little shortcut for this demonstration. And finally, load. Load to the path of the file. Now, earlier when we uploaded and created our tables, we uploaded files, we stored them on the local Databricks file system, which is just a logical name for local storage, blob storage really, in Databricks. So DBFS is just the local storage for Databricks, which automatically gets created for us as part of our workspace creation. Underneath that, we create any number of folders, but file store tables is the default folders that will store any files that we use the GUI in Databricks to upload files to. So that's what happened here. And there's a file we uploaded earlier, Fact Internet Sales, which comes from the AdventureWorks data that is provided by Microsoft. So that's going to get stored in a data frame called SPDF underscore sales. So we know that that is a Spark Python data frame and it contains sales information. We also want to load SPDF sales territory. Again, it's the same information as before, nothing really different except here we're going to be bringing a dimension table dim sales territory. I also want to highlight something else about this. If you notice that I've got this parentheses around the entire statement, you might say, why are you doing that, Brian? I don't get that. I'm doing that because I don't want to have to make this one long statement that wraps around my cell and makes it really hard to read. By putting parentheses around it, Python will automatically understand that it's all one statement and I can break it out over multiple lines to make it more readable. This is considered a PEP standard or a Python coding standard of best practice. It's part of PEP 8. I start in a blog somewhere and I thought, I'm going to do that. So that's why I'm doing that piece. Here I'm going to do one thing also I just want to demonstrate. Once I've loaded SPDF sales, I'm going to reprocess it here and drop out the any rows that have NAs in those columns. So it's just the pre-processing. Now I could create a whole new data frame, but I'm just going to return what comes out of this to the same name data frame. But since Spark data frames are immutable, it will return a new data frame. It will not modify an existing data frame. So I'm going to press Control Enter just to run this. And you can see that it tells us what are the column breakdowns. So you get a nice little description of the schema of the tables. I want to show you another way that line continuations can be done in Python, but it's not a recommended best practice. I'm showing you because I see it a lot in example codes and I don't want you to get confused. And the simple thing is instead of notice there's no parentheses wrapping the statement, instead at the end you have a backslash and then the line continues and then another backslash here and the line continues. That's better than not breaking up the line at all, but it's a lot kludgier in terms of syntax. In other words, it's easy to break that and get it wrong so that the code doesn't work. But more importantly, you don't have as much control over the formatting as you can see here. So the parentheses approach I showed you 
previously is the better way to go. Nonetheless, I am going to use this cell here. I'll run this just to show it does work. And I'm going to do the same exact code again just to see this is exactly the same thing. And you can see it is a lot nicer to read, but it's doing the same thing. Now, there is something I want to show you here, which is I'm doing the same kind of thing here. I'm loading a table from a file, right? A data frame from a file. But I'm telling it the column names in this case. I wanted to demonstrate that you can explicitly name the columns. But because I'm doing this, you don't want to have the column names in the first row because that will cause it to reuse them. You'll basically have column names as data. So you have to be a little bit careful about that. So here I'm saying header is false, meaning it does not have the column names in the first row. And here I'm specifying the column names. And a nice feature of using Python in general is that you can just keep using periods to chain methods onto a given statement. So I'll rerun this and just show that it does the same thing. There's a lot of ways to display information in Databricks. And one of them is just to use the good old built-in really spark thing called show. Show takes an optional parameter, which is how many rows do you want to get? So I'm going to say show four. And you see that it, it does have a fairly readable format. It's not as nice as the display that you get in Databricks, but show is supported by open source spark, whereas display is not. Now there is a way you could do something else. I could do, instead of doing that, I could just say take. And take forces the Spark data frame to be executed. In other words, whatever it takes to create that data frame has to be completed so it can retrieve a few rows and bring it back. And the show statement also did the same thing. But you'll notice that it's not as easy to read. So again, I would say you're probably going to want to go for readability cases like this with the show function instead. What if I want to return the data as a pandas data frame? So in other words, Here's my Spark data frame. It's distributed all over the cluster, but I need to use it locally for whatever reason. I can attach the two pandas method and do that. Now, I want to be clear here. If I really wanted to hold on to that pandas data frame, I'm going to have to assign it to a different object. This is going to just temporarily bring the data back and put it into my notebook, but that's all it will do. It won't store it anywhere. But let me just show you what happens here. I do two pandas. And interestingly, and what will kind of remind you, in fact, is it is a pandas data frame. It looks just the way a pandas data frame would display in a Jupyter notebook. Now, to prove that what we're really doing here is getting a pandas data frame back, I'm going to wrap this in a type function. So it will tell me, what is this actually returning? And it's returning, you can see right here, it's a pandas core data frame. So we now can confirm what type of uh, data frame we're getting back. I get a lot of questions about performance tuning and Apache Spark. And I want to caution people a little bit about that. I understand the need for performance tuning, but there's a lot happening in this space, primarily based on the work that Databricks is doing, but it is also being put into the open source Spark. It's particularly is called Adaptive Query Execution, and I put a link in here, go look it up. But what it says in a nutshell is that when you're using data frames, any kind of tabular data in Apache Spark, it's going to really analyze what you're doing with its performance analyzer, which is built into it. And it's going to try to find the most efficient way to satisfy your query. So you probably don't have to do a lot of work trying to force it to perform well. The takeaway I want to really say there is don't assume you have to do a lot of work to performance tune your code. See how it performs first, and then look at ways to make it faster if you need to. Um, in particular, I noticed when I was reading on some of this that streaming doesn't always work. Does, I don't think it does work with adaptive query execution. But again, that's also changing because now the streaming model is being merged in the, in the standard model for data processing so that it's becoming ubiquitous, really, between the two. So again, my, my only real point there is um, leverage what Databricks will do for you automatically, and don't reinvent the wheel because they're doing a great job of extending that functionality. However, having said that, one quick thing you can do is when you know you're going to be using a data frame again, you can cache it. What does that mean, Brian? What is caching? I get money for it? No. What it means is it's going to take that data frame and it's going to pin it into memory. It will hold it there so that you can come back and get it and Databricks won't just push it out of memory and then have to recompute the, the data frame later to bring it back for you. So that's what it means. And I'm going to do that here just to demonstrate. It's very simple. 
just give it the data frame name and you just say dot cache parentheses and it's cached very simple now sometimes you need to rename a column in a data frame spark data frames are immutable which means I cannot change them so instead what I need to do is make that change and return it to a new data frame so here I've got my SPDF sales and I use the spark method PySpark method with column renamed then I give it the old name and I give it the new name I'm returning that because again it has to return a new data frame it's going to return the new data frame to SPDF underscore sales so I'm using the same names rather than creating a new name but it's going to actually create a brand new data frame I'm doing this in particular because I want to join this data frame to the customer data frame and I'm going to be joining on customer key I don't want to have duplicate column names in my spark data frame which it actually will let you do which can cause you issues when you do things like trying to save the data frame to a table so I'm going to rename customer key to sales customer key and then I can keep track that that actually that key came from the sales side data frame and then I can join it so let me run this and you can see here it renamed the customer key to sales customer key let me take a look at this another thing I can do and I'm just trying to show you different ways you can display but the display function is extremely powerful and probably really underrated in Databricks. They don't talk a lot about it because they're always talking about Delta Lake and other things, but the display statement is extremely powerful. And I want to display from my Spark data frame here just five rows. I can wrap the SPDF underscore sales data frame take five method. Take five says give me five rows back. But by wrapping that in the display, I'll get it back in a nice displayable format and I can even click on columns to sort and things like that and I can even go into visualizations etc I like to do things as quick as possible in the most efficient way and often when you're doing exploratory data analysis you want to get statistical data around the numeric columns for instance you may want to get averages the max min etc a quick way to do that is by using the PySpark data frame method describe and once I get that, I can put in a list of column names I want it to do this on. So let me run it because I think it's a lot easier to see this. And notice I'm wrapping this entire statement as a display, again, so that it's easier to sort, look at. I can click on these things and sort things around, etc. But all I'm really doing is saying I want to get statistical information for these two columns. So I pass them in as a list. And I get standard deviation, count, mean, max, and min. I could list as many columns as I want and I'll get these statistics very quickly. This is a really nice way to just quickly get some information you need, especially if you're doing data science. I did a lot of talking in the last video about using SQL from PySpark. And I want to do it very quickly here, really just as a way to get some data from the customer table rather than loading it from a CSV file. So to do that, again, I'm just going to say spark.sql and then pass in the query as a doc string. And a doc string means three quotes, and then your string, which can go over multiple lines, and then the end of the three quotes. I only want to retrieve, another good reason for using the table is I only want to retrieve a handful of columns. I don't need all of them. By the way, that's a really good performance thing. Never bring back columns in Spark that you don't need. If you have 600 columns and you say, just do an asterisk, you wonder why it performs poorly. It's because you're bringing back probably a lot of unneeded data. Only take what you really need and your performance is going to definitely be better and it's also of course the best practice so here we're just taking a handful of columns customer key geographic key co uh, commute distance the birth date and the gender and we're going to return that here now notice that i've prefixed the table with aw project because when we created our tables earlier we created it in the aw project database this next cell has a lot going on so i'll walk through this piece by piece my main interest here is to really show you two things one, how to join data frames. Similar to what you can do with SQL tables, you can join data frames. The other thing I want to show you, though, is how much power you can get by just tacking on using the period. You can just tack on multiple methods to do a lot of work. So we're going to, in this case, we're going to take the SPDF sales. All right, We're going to join that to SPDF customer that we just created. And if you remember, we changed the customer key name on sales to sales customer key. So we're going to say where the SPDF sales customer key is equal to the SPDF customer customer key. We want this to be done as an inner join. So we just pass that as a string next to it, inner. So that means it's going to mean 
both data frames must have this key value for it to be retrieved. Now the idea typically when you're joining is that you have often one detail type of table like sales and then the other one it has a key that will be a unique key to another table. So in this case there may be many many sales rows and many of them will have the same customer but when each row is joined to the customer there'll only be one customer on the customer table with that key. So that's a pretty common pattern when you're doing joins. Not all the time but many times you'll be doing that. Now within that we want to select certain rows. We can say we can just put a period on this and say select and I used asterisks and quotes which means all columns but I could have said specific columns that I want which would be a good idea. I'm just being a little lazier because there's a lot of columns I'd have to select from. I want to show you also this but I wanted to use the round function which is not built into PySpark but it's available as a SQL function as part of the PySpark library. To do that I can say import PySpark SQL function and then I say as a prefix FUNC function and that allows me to call that function in and then I can take the sales amount that's coming in and round it to a whole number meaning that's what the zero does. There's a lot of SQL functions in there and this is a great way to extend our functionality and know that we're going to be using performant functions and those they work efficiently so we get a lot of power there and all we really have to do is import this library and we're good to go. Unfortunately this will come back with the default name which is you can see here which is round just what we gave round sales amount comma zero. It's not a very attractive name when you're looking at data or you want to manipulate the data frame coming back. So we're going to rename it as sales rounded we can do that using with columns we named. And we also want to do a filter so I just wanted to show you for instance we can add even more functionality here by, app, uh, by appending the filter which will say where order date is greater than 2010 12 21 which means it will only select sales that occurred in 2011 or later. That's going to all be returned to SPDF underscore sales customer. And here we'll just do a display of some of the rows there and notice another way I can do this is to say limit 3 display and the cool thing here is you can actually append the display method as opposed to wrapping the entire thing in display. So there's a lot going on there and you can certainly go back and look at that. If I go over here you can see that it did indeed round the sales and if we go back here you can see that the sales amount was not originally rounded but generally when you're going to be doing data wrangling on a scaled out platform like Spark you're going to try to reduce your data coming back to the head node by using aggregations. You're not interested in individual rows when there's a trillion rows. You're really going to be looking at averages or summaries or something like that. Which means you're going to want to do aggregations. That's easy to do again. We can do here we're using the data frame and we can use grouping or aggregation functions like group by. Here we want to group by the commute distance. We'd want to look at commute distance in this case because maybe the distance that a customer lives from their work affects whether they buy the bike. In other words, are they buying the bike so they can ride it to work? Shorter commute distances would support that theory. Here we're going to do an aggregation and we're going to say just aggregate the sales amount and we're going to do a sum. If you notice the braces around that, that implies this is in fact a dictionary. And that's nice because we can just pass as many name value pairs in this dictionary as we want. We're only doing one in this case, but we now know we can do more. We can also do an order by. And remember what I said before, you get these default names. So in this case, when I do the sum, I'm getting some sales amount, which admittedly is a bit ugly. But it shows us how we can do this. So let me run this. And I wrap the whole thing in a display so it comes back and it's easy to look at. Look like, let me sort it by sales amount. It does look like customers are probably buying bikes to commute to work because they tend to have less than a mile commute distance and then shorter distances tend to get higher sales. So it looks like that's a pretty good possibility. Let's get a little bit more advanced with our aggregations. Mainly I want to do more than just one thing. So this is really the same idea as before but I'm going to aggregate now several columns. I'm not just going to do sales amount which we just did but I also do want to do account and since account does not apply to a single column, I use an asterisk instead of a column name. I also want to do an average of the tax amount. I want to demonstrate though, you may not like those ugly column names you're seeing. So we can fix that by using with column renamed 
and I had to run it first to see what it named this, but not surprisingly, it named it AVG in parentheses tax amount. And I'm gonna rename that AVG tax. The other columns are still gonna have those ugly names, but you'll get the idea at least how to do this. And I can then do an order by by my count. If I run this, and I did this as a visual, so it kind of kept that, but I can go here and you get the actual amounts. So you can see now we have the average tax, AVG tax is now renamed. We have our count and we have our sales sum amount. But again, a cool thing with using display is I can do a little graph like this. And this really makes it clear that people with less than a mile to travel are the bulk of our customers, bulk of our sales. The next one, one to two and two to five supports that also. I would tend to expect anyone commuting more than 10 miles probably is not riding a bike. So what about using a local data frame? We want to get a pandas data frame. It's pretty easy to do. Now, why would we do this as I mentioned before? One good reason is you may actually not need trillions of rows to train a model. You may only need really a, maybe a couple of thousand or 50,000 rows or something fairly small. Sounds a little counterintuitive, but oftentimes people forget that the heavy lifting on something like Apache Spark is in the data wrangling. And once you get the data summarized, aggregated, or whatever you need filtered, you may only need a small subset of that to actually train your model. It's not unusual. The getting through a trillion rows is a huge amount of work. But you may find that now that you've kind of distributed the data so that it's not skewed and you've cleaned it up and you've got your model features, you may be able to train a model and use a small subset of data which can save you a lot of time and money. You also may just want to use a small subset to do a visual with. And again, as we pointed out, if you try to bring everything back, you'll crash the cluster. So here we're gonna say, take the SPDF sales customer, the one that has the sales and customer information, Spark data frame. And I wanna just demonstrate, you can also just drop the extra key. You don't need sales customer key twice. And we're gonna do a sample. Now I'm taking a lot here, so, cause it's not huge data we're using. First permanent is with replacement. And I'm gonna say false. I do not wanna reuse values. Once it's either pulled a value, once it's pulled a row from the data frame, I don't want it to pull that row again. So that's the idea there, false. I'm going to get 0.7, which means 70% of the data frame. So that's a huge part of the data frame. Most of the time, if it's really a large data set, you probably put that down to even 1% or something. But I'm, And here I'm using a seed number. If I don't set a seed number, it will, should randomly give me back different sets. But sometimes you want predictable results. So I'm getting a subset, but setting it to 42, which of course from the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy is the answer to life, the universe, and everything, will allow me to get the same result set back every time I run it, which sometimes is useful when I'm trying to do testing and debugging. I'm converting the sample to pandas so that the net result of this whole thing is I'm getting a sample of the data frame returned back to me as a pandas data frame. I'm gonna return that back to lpdf underscore sales customer. Again, the L means local Python data frame, so it's a pandas data frame. Let me run this. Let's take a look at the data. And yet another way is using the head statement. So lots of ways we can do this. But remember, this method head is specific to a local pandas data frame. We can see, and I'm just showing three rows, but we can see it worked, it looks good. See all the data in here, great. Let's confirm that that really is a pandas data frame. So we can use the type function and sure enough it says pandas core frame data frame. So we know that's a local pandas data frame. Let's do some aggregation with the local pandas data frame we just created. What I want to do is take these LPDF sales customer we just created. I'm going to group it by gender and I want to aggregate sales amount. I want to get a sum of sales amount. Let me return the result to LPDF sales by gender. And then what I want to do is do a plot of that data as a bar chart and see how it looks. Not a great bar chart, but the important thing I really want to demonstrate is this is an example of I'm able to use local pandas visualization within a Databricks notebook. I put this in as well because when you need to do that kind of thing, uh, plotting, and you, maybe you want to use matplotlib, this is a good set of libraries. You can cut and paste this into your own if you like that will allow me to use numpy, pandas, et cetera, and do matplotlib as well in visualization. So I can just run that. I'm not going to use matplotlib though. My next example, I'd rather use Seaborn. And again, this is not a great visualization. It's a standard type of Seaborn library. Let me run it. And what it's really designed to show you is creating box plots for sales 
from males and females by gender broken up over commute distance. You can see it here. This is just standard Seaborn Python code. This could run just as easily in a Jupyter Notebook run on my, running on my own machine. And you can see here is where I pass in the pandas data frame. I would not be able to run that if it were a Spark data frame. That's the biggest takeaway. And finally, one more example of using pandas. I'm going to take that same pandas data frame, do a group by gender, and then I'm going to wrap sales amount here and append sum to it and round. Different way to get to sort of the same result. If I don't append this round part, if you've used pandas before, it tends to give you these long decimal places, which we've already seen somewhat. So the round kind of cleans it up a bit. And what I'm doing here is just getting total sales for males and females. And we can see that uh, they're really pretty close, right? They're not much different. Another thing from an efficiency standpoint, performance, one thing you can also do is using something called a broadcast. You would use a broadcast when you want to join between two tables. And one table is extremely large, but the other one is really tiny. And this is a pretty common thing, right? Usually like things like product codes, um, status codes maybe. In this case, we're going to be using territory, sales territory. It's a small table, maybe 20K, maybe less. I think this is really like 5K. It's very tiny. So instead of distributing that data frame over the cluster nodes, which would probably be like a record or two per node, wouldn't it make a lot more sense just to copy the entire table to every node and just have it available? Is it a little bit wasteful? Yeah, but it's a tiny data frame. It's not going to hurt much. The advantage is it avoids a lot of shuffling and work on the Spark cluster because the tiny data frame is now local on every node. So it can do all the work locally to each node before returning the result to the driver. That's the gist of it. We're going to do that here. We're going to say from PySpark, again, bring in SQL functions, broadcast. We're going to just bring in broadcast. We're going to create a data frame, SPDF sales territory, by joining the sales. But this time, we're going to say join. And then we're going to say broadcast, sale, SPDF sales territory. That broadcast function is telling Spark to take that data frame and copy it on all the nodes before it does the join. And it's going to be joining on the sales territory key which is the same name in both data frames. And we're doing this as a left join. Let's take a look. We're going we're gonna to now use that data frame, and we can list the specific columns we want to pull from it using a sort of nested list approach. And then we can just append the display statement to that. So let's run this. And this, I already set up a visual, but we can also see the data here came back. And we can see the sales, sales territory group, sales territory region, sales amount, sales order number. And now I can do visuals with it. But the main point of that is we were able to use the broadcast join that in many cases could greatly improve performance. The use case for those is when you have a really small data frame that you know is not going to be a problem copying over the nodes. So that's all I have on this one. There was a lot to talk about. We covered a lot of things. I don't really have a neat summary for you because we really talked about many different subjects. But the gist of the entire video was data wrangling using data frame methods, or specifically PySpark data frame methods. Get comfortable with those. Learn about them. We're going to talk about other things we can do in future videos. But it's important you understand that before you can really advance to other topics. So thank you. Please leave comments. Please like, share, subscribe. Let other people know about my channel. It's really great when I see people getting a lot of value from this. Till next time, I'm pulling for you. We're all in this together. Thank you.